everyone. Thanks for coming out on this snowy afternoon. Um, welcome to our annual Junior Parents Weekend of Lecture. I am Suzanne Fulton, and I direct the Center for Social Concerns. Uh, for folks unfamiliar with the Center, the Center for Social Concerns responds to the complex demands of justice through research, courses, and community engagement grounded in dignity, affirming solidarity with marginalized communities. One of the ways that we engage both with the university and the local community is by gathering for our ongoing critical conversations. Today's event with Jonathan Wilson Hargrove on beloved community and poverty is part of that continuing conversation. For us at the center, the study of poverty begins with dignity affirming solidarity precisely because poverty is more than a line and people experiencing poverty are more than a problem to solve. Center courses and research engage people experiencing in poverty to learn from them about the challenges they face and how we might address them together. Jonathan's work is well aligned with this effort. Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove is a spiritual writer, preacher, and community cultivator. He serves as the Assistant Director for Partnerships and Fellowships at Yale University for Public Theology and Public Policy. A native of North Carolina, Jonathan is a graduate of Eastern University and the Duke Divinity School. He and his wife, Leah, founded Rupa House, a house of hospitality, where the formerly unhoused share community with the formerly housed. Jonathan also founded the School Up for Conversion, a popular education center that works to make surprising friendships possible in Durham, North Carolina. He is an associate pastor at the Historically Black St. John's Ministry of Baptist Church. Jonathan is the compiler of the celebrated Common Prayer, a liturgy for ordinary radicals, and is the author of several books on Christian spirituality, including Reconsidering the Gospel, Strangers at My Door, The Awakening of Hope, The Wisdom of Stability, and The New Monasticism. He's busy. He is also co-author with Reverend William Barber II of the Third Reconstruction, Moral Mondays, Fusion Politics, and the Rise of the New Justice Movement. A Baptist who draws on the broad Christian tradition and its monastic witnesses, Jonathan is a leader in the Red Letter Christian Movement and the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. He speaks often about spirituality and faith in public life, to churches and conferences across denominational spectrum, and has given lectures at a dozen of universities like our own. We're honored to have him here with us today. Uh, before I welcome him and invite him up, I just want to give a shout out to thanks to various folks here at the center who have enabled today's great event, including Amber Herkey and her beautiful child, Suzu, who have just joined us. Uh, but thanks to Aaron Miller, Judy Benchar, uh, Paula Mulher uh, for producing this event, and to J.P. Shortle and Kevin Allen, who were in the back, who did all the communications. This was very much a joint effort uh, to produce today. Also, a quick logistical note that after the lecture, we have very tasty snacks upstairs in the coffee house. So please do join us then for informal conversation. So with that, welcome, Jonathan. Great to have you here. <laughs> Well, it's a joy to be here with you on a snowy day. Uh, I'm a southerner, so this isn't normal, but uh, I'm glad to see that y'all carry on and still show up. When it snows in my town, nobody shows up for anything. Uh, we're, we're gathered to talk about poverty and the beloved community, and um, uh, poverty is um, a serious crisis. Uh, I, I wanted to begin by just emphasizing, because I think it's not widely known, that poverty is the fourth leading cause of death in the United States. Now, we have a lot of conversations about the gun crisis, which is killing a lot of people in this country. Poverty is killing a lot more people than guns. Um, we had a, a White House summit several years ago on vaping, which I'm no fan of vaping either, uh, and I'm sure there are problems. I, I, I grew up in tobacco country. There's lots of problems with anything you suck down your lungs. But at, at any rate, uh, uh, a real issue. But nevertheless, a lot more people are dying from poverty. So uh, 
I want to spend a little time facing something that a lot of forces, I think, conspire to keep us from seeing and paying attention to. But I do that with a recognition that um, all of us human beings look away from hard and painful things because, well, uh, we're trying to survive. You know, we're, we're, uh, there's a natural impulse, even despite any forces that are distracting us, there's a natural impulse to turn away. And so we need real resources in order to face hard things. James Baldwin said, um, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. I think Baldwin also understood that, uh, that there are deep wells to draw from in terms of being able to face hard things. And uh, my own journey of trying to face poverty and the, the, the reality of the crisis that uh, is real, not just around the world, but in this country, uh, is uh, um, possible because of the resources of the beloved community. And um, one of the best resources that this tradition offers us is song. <laughs> So I like to start by asking people to sing. I hope you don't mind. I know you didn't come to a choir practice, but, um, but I'm a song leader because Bernice Johnson Reagan, who was a great song leader in the civil rights movement and uh, still is a great song leader. I'll tell you a quick story. Uh, if, you, if you've never heard Sweet Honey in the Rock, you should download it on whatever uh, form you listen to music on. But that's her group that has uh, done great songs for years. But they were invited during the Obama administration to come and per per perform at a White House celebration. They, they had these concerts. Uh, they were great concerts. Uh, I, I didn't go to them, but I saw them online during the Obama administration. Anyway, they were invited to come. And when they uh, got up to sing, uh, she started a classic song of the, is there something I can do to make this not ring? Sorry. I'm, it's sort of an echo. Yeah, I realized I was, I was ringing the bells. I, I'm, if I'm saying it in the wrong place, y'all tell me. Anyway, um, uh, so you can imagine the scene. The, uh, Bernice Johnson Reagan, she's got her group there here on this you know, stage, and it's a small room like this. And right in the front row is uh, the Obama family, you know, the President of the United States and his family. So uh, she starts off singing this great uh, song of the Civil Rights Movement, Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Me Around, and gets a couple of lines into it, and she waves down the band which you know, usually in practice means something isn't going right. So I thought maybe she was gonna turn around and tell them to do it in a different key or something. But instead, she looks directly at the Obamas and says, uh, this isn't a performance. This is a song that's meant to be sung together. And then she looked the president in the eyes and said, because you never know when you're going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> so you never know when you're going to need these resources that have been passed down to us. But, um, but I need them to face poverty. And I think maybe collectively we do, too. So I thought I'd, I'd quickly tell you the story of a song that you already know. Um, it's a song that comes out of the black church tradition in the South. And uh, I'll tell you, the Baptist church where I'm a member uh, still sings this song, and uh, after eight years of the Obamas being in the White House, um, there was some concern, I'll say, there was some concern at our church after the 2016 election, and on the Sunday following that election, this song was the first song that the male chorus chose to sing, and uh, we usually sing it pretty upbeat, and usually in most churches in the South, you'll hear something like this, I'll be all right, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. After a while, after a while, there's a little echo. I won't do the whole thing, but anyway, it's it's a pretty upbeat song. It draws on this deep faith that even when things are difficult, even when things are hard, we're we're going to be all right after a while. Uh, there's a a forward-looking hope that's rooted in that song. Well, that song has a long history, and uh, um, people who grow up in the church have often taken that song with them into other spaces. Uh, the Highlander Folk School, which has been a popular education center in the South for uh, nearly a century now, uh, used to have, or was started by um, a couple, and the wife of that couple was a, a cultural arts organizer. Her name was Zulfia Horton. And Zulfia Horton used to go around to uh, labor struggles and other justice struggles in the country, and she would listen closely for what songs were being sung. And she noted at a tobacco workers' strike in South Carolina uh, back in the 30s that there was a, a woman who had grown up in probably in a Baptist church, much like my own, 
uh, and she knew this song, but when she was singing it on the picket line, she really drew it out. Maybe because uh, she knew she was going to be there all day. Uh, but maybe also because uh, she wanted to uh, moan a little bit. You know, in the in the church, they say sometimes you have to moan because the devil don't understand what you're saying when you moan. Uh, at any rate, she she turned that sort of upbeat song into something drawn out, and she made it a song for people to sing together in the struggle. Zilpia said she was singing it on the picket line, something like this. We'll be all right. We'll be all right. Lord Jesus, we'll be all right after a while. And she thought, that's a pretty good song. That's a pretty good song. So part of her job back then was she would listen to songs that were being sung in struggles and she would introduce them to people in other struggles uh, at trainings that they did at the Highlander Folk School. And uh, there were also, you know, musicians who would come through and listen with her to the songs of the movement. One of them was a guy named Pete Seeger. And uh, when Pete came through with his guitar, he kind of had a distinctive way of uh, uh, getting the rhythm going with that song. And uh, you probably know it best by his rhythm. But by the time uh, in 1960, that students began to sit in at the lunch counters, first in my home state of uh, North Carolina and in Greensboro, but it spread quickly all across the country uh, from February 1st uh, through the spring. Uh, scores of uh, campuses across the country had students doing direct actions at lunch counters. Um, and just as an aside here, uh, I always like to tell this story because sometimes organizers think, you know, we've got huge challenges today. Uh, but uh, one of the great organizers of that era uh, just think about this practically. Ella Baker was her name. Ella Baker read the news stories about what was happening in Greensboro, at Bennett College, at A&T, and at other places, Nashville, Tennessee. And she, uh, now no Google here, right? She literally got people to mail her hard copies of newspapers, clipped out the names of people who were named in the newspaper because they had been arrested, and figured out which college they were at, and sent them invitations to come to a gathering at Shaw University on Easter weekend. So she did all this in about two and a half months, between February 1st and Easter weekend of that year. And, and, and at, that, at that gathering, they organized the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. But when they were all together, you know, this is their first chance to be all together, uh, she said, well, we, we need somebody to lead the singing. So she invited the folks from Highlander to come and teach this song. And this is how the song that you and I know as We Shall Overcome became the anthem of the movement. This song that had come from the church to the picket line to, you know, this mix of movements that were sharing resources with each other. Uh, uh, it, it, it grew into this song that, that literally went around the world. So you know it. And uh, I thought we could sing it together just to steal ourselves a little bit to face the reality of poverty in the tradition of the beloved community. So we shall overcome, we shall overcome, we shall overcome someday. Oh, oh, my heart, I do believe we shall overcome someday. You all sound pretty good. <laughs> Bernice always says, when we get together, we have to sing because the point of the song is to get to the singing. And the point of the singing is to make us into a community. And if you're going to face hard things, you need community. So we'll sing together again before we end. I thought I would tell you a little bit of my own story, just as a way of uh, introducing how I've come to uh, understand and think about the crisis of poverty in America today. 
I grew up in North Carolina, uh, and when I was growing up in the 80s and 90s, uh, I was an ambitious kid. I uh, was also a, a Baptist then, as I am now. And uh, uh, as a white Baptist in North Carolina then, uh, I, I now know that my community was largely influenced by what uh, we call the religious right, or uh, today's sociologists call white Christian nationalists. And, uh, and in that context, uh, I really wanted to become president of the United States for Jesus. That was kind of my goal. Um, and so I, I was on that train uh, for a while, uh, tr trying to sort of, you know, figure out how to make that real. And uh, in the course of that, pretty quickly realized that there was a basic tension between this notion that you exercise the largest empire in the world's power uh, in order to... Uh, um, force other people to believe so-called Christian values and the things that Jesus actually taught. Uh, and I will say, the people that raised me on the Bible, they did make me learn what Jesus actually taught. I mean, we, we memorized the scriptures, you know, in the King James Version, because if it was good enough for Jesus, it was good enough for us. I mean, we had our <laughs> we had our ways of thinking about things, but nevertheless, uh, we, we took the Bible seriously. And um, and so I, I grew up in that context uh, but realized that the sort of way of putting faith into practice in public life that I had been raised on was uh, was was flawed, and I, I needed to find another way. And uh, in the midst of that journey, I came across this tradition of houses of hospitality, uh, that good Catholic social teaching, <laughs> you know, <laughs> since. Uh, since I'm here at Notre Dame, I'll have to, I'll have to give thanks that uh, Dorothy Day and others lifted up this, this notion that, uh, you know, Jesus taught us some things about how we live in the world, and if you put those things into practice, um, uh, that, can, that can really change your way of life. Uh, but it can also bring you into relationship with people that you might not know otherwise. And uh, I ended up spending some time in and around Catholic worker communities and other houses of hospitality and be beginning to uh, realize that, uh, that there was a call on my life. There was a sort of a vocational call to get in the way of the violence of this world. Um, this is back in the early 2000s when uh, the tradition that I come from, the evangelical tradition, was very allied with the Bush White House and decided uh, that they needed to, that we needed to wage a holy war in Iraq. Some of you may remember that, that there was this notion that, uh, especially after 9-11, that we were going to rid the world of evil by bombing countries, first Afghanistan and then Iraq. Um, I, uh, I think about this often uh, these days when uh, there's, uh, you know, such strong language sometimes used to condemn the sort of, you know, imperial uh, aspirations of other countries in the world willing to just bomb places and, uh, uh, and, and call for regime change. We've been involved in this sort of thing, too. And uh, at, at that moment, when that was happening, I and uh, my wife, Leah, we got involved with this group called the Christian Peacemaker Teams. Uh, their mission has been to get in the way, they say, uh, the way being the way of Jesus, the way of nonviolent love, but also to literally like get in the way of violence, get in between uh, parties who are who are uh, attacking one another, and to to try to practice nonviolence in those contexts. And we ended up having the chance to go to Iraq with the Christian peacemaker teams while our country was dropping bombs. It was a um, an eye opening experience in many ways. Uh, and I won't tell that whole story here, but out of that experience, we ended up um, uh, being in a caravan that uh, wrecked on a road that was being bombed. And uh, the only, we, I was not injured, but several of our friends were injured, and the only uh, way we could get them help was by taking them to uh, the closest town, it was a town called Rutba, and it happened that three days before, the United States had bombed the hospital in Rutba. So there was no hospital, but some of the doctors had survived, and they were willing to take care of our American friends. And um, we had this experience of radical hospitality. People who our country had just bombed 
saved our friends' lives, and I offered to pay the doctor, you know, for his services after our, you know, we got our friends patched up enough that we could we could get back on the road. And uh, he said, "You don't owe me anything." He said, "Please just tell people what's really happening here." So when we came back to the United States in 2003, and we're telling that story of this radical hospitality that we had received, we ended up starting a hospitality house and named it after this town where, where these doctors are taking care of our friends. It's called Rutba, Iraq. And so I've lived the last 20 years of my life at Rutba House in Durham, a house of hospitality where, uh, you know, those of us who are trying to find community uh, have, have shared life with, you know, people who uh, often know a lot about community, but we're trying to find housing. And so, you know, we've, we've shared uh, life around the table and, uh, and in, in household uh, in that space. And that has been my window on this reality of poverty that um, is in so many ways an overwhelming An overwhelming cancer, I think, on our common life. Um, I think about it in terms of particular people. You know, you, you 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 can talk about it in terms of the numbers, but when you know people, you know, people who um, have within them the light of truth and you know, in, in my Christian tradition, the image of God stamped on them. Uh, and, you know, people are people. That's always messy. All of us have our quirks. But you, when you know people and love people, and you begin to realize that the, the main thing that is destroying people is the fact that they don't have the basic necessities of life. I think that's what has brought me more than anything to this to this deep sense that this is a crisis uh, and poverty ends up you know landing on people in various ways so as a hospitality house in a city that calls itself the city of medicine uh, you know we opened the doors and we ended up hosting a lot of people who had been made poor by health care <laughs> right i mean you know sometimes them sometimes uh, you know someone in their family needing major medical care, and when, the, and when they were done paying for that, there was nothing left. Uh, they landed on the streets. Uh, sometimes it was the system of, uh, you know, mass incarceration that, that, that has directed so many people who are impoverished and has focused on impoverished communities uh, into prisons that often do very little to prepare people for uh, a life after they're released, and so people land in poverty. Um, so, so many stories like that compiled by a realization that, that the economic reality for so many people has continued to become more challenging uh, apart from any particular personal circumstances. Uh, Y'all know this, I don't have to tell you. Uh, students, if you're here, you're, you're, uh, you're accruing debt many of you to, to get your education and the prospects of you know having uh, a high a higher enough income because of your education to pay off the debt that that, that 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 return has been diminishing for some time in this country the gap between the people who are making a whole lot and the people who are barely getting by has been increasing one way I saw this uh, uh, very concretely here in the neighborhood where I lived for the last 20 years when we moved into the neighborhood, this, the little house across the street uh, was uh, home to three guys who I got to know. They had all grown up in the neighborhood, and they were all over 60 at the time. And um, they all lived on their Social Security income and little odd jobs that they could get here and there. But they rented this house together for $295 a month. And, uh, you know doing odd jobs and cutting grass and fixing bikes and getting the monthly check, they made ends meet. They lived the remainder of their days in, in that house. That same house that 20 years ago rented for $295 a month rents now for $1,800 a month. 
it's the same house, folks. Uh, I mean, they may have redone the kitchen or something, but it's the same house. Uh, but these are the sort of economic forces that people are facing all over the country, and I, I don't have to tell you uh, about that for you to uh, to know that it's real. But but this is what has, I think, uh, opened my eyes to the way that the crisis of poverty is uh, is not it's it's not something that uh, uh, you know we need to help. A particular person or a particular family to kind of you know make it through so they can get to the other side. Now this is a systemic problem that is um, that that is really beginning to compromise the sustainability of our society, and I think it's fair to say the sustainability of democracy in this country. Um, so the second thing that made me realize that it's something that I had to be involved in was this faith question that I've continued to carry with me. So I, I you know, it, I, I was uh, caught up in this religious right. I got on this track of being a sort of uh, uh, Christian, trying to be engaged in social justice and in being part of a house of hospitality. And then I began to realize that so much of the system that is making people poor has been justified with Christian theology and, and by people who share my faith. Um, uh, there's a whole story of how uh, in the 1920s and 30s, when uh, in the United States, uh, there, particularly after the Great Depression, there was a, um, there was a lot of suspicion about uh, the, the titans of capital, you know, the people who ran the big businesses in this country. And uh, Kevin Cruz at Princeton and other historians have gone back and told this story. But uh, when, when those people who wanted to regain the trust of the country uh, conducted a survey, they found that the most trusted people in many communities in this country were pastors, whether, I mean, whatever their tradition, whether they were you know, Catholic priests or Baptist preachers or whoever. Uh, people, trust, people didn't trust CEOs very much. Um, People still trusted uh, uh, government officials more then than they do now, but people trusted pastors more than anyone. And so the National uh, Chamber of Commerce actually invested in a, uh, a network of uh, preachers that were organized under something called spiritual mobilization and uh, developed a theology of Christian libertarianism, which was a way of, uh, of, of sort of applying Calvinist theology to say, uh, if you're good, God will give you riches, and if you're bad, you're poor, which is a, a, a way of explaining that uh, you know people who are poor, it's not society's responsibility, it's their responsibility. And many of the narratives we have that blame poor people for their poverty have been uh, developed and grown out of that Christian justification of poverty. Well, I think we have really good research now uh, that makes it clear that a lot of the poverty in this country is the result of policy choices that we've made. Um, our friend and colleague, Matthew Desmond, has written a great book on this. Uh, I encourage you to read it. It's called Poverty by America. Not poverty in America, but poverty by America, because Matt looks closely at um, at the, the policy decisions that have been made and says, we know what it would take to reduce poverty in this country. Um, here's an example. We all saw it, right? During the pandemic, in uh, one of the big bills that got passed, you know, to try to get us through the pandemic, uh, we expanded the child tax credit. You remember that? Um, and Immediately, there was uh, evidence that just the uh, expansion of the child tax credit that was that was done uh, during the pandemic cut child poverty in half in this country, which you would think is something that most people would celebrate. I mean, I didn't hear anybody saying it was a bad thing that we cut child poverty in half. Nevertheless, uh, the when it came back around to be renewed. Uh, the politicians in Washington decided that that was not worth the investment. Um, and I'm not just talking about Republicans. 
there were Democrats also uh, who refused to continue the expansion of the child tax credit. That's just one example. But uh, if, you, if you read Poverty by America, I mean, uh, he really goes through uh, many parts of our public policy, tax policy, the way we, you know, uh, reward people for, uh, you know, the interest paid on houses, you know, uh, is, is a huge investment in uh, people who have homes. And yet, uh, you know, if you look at it in total, we're investing uh, as a country far less in people who need more than we invest in, in people who have property. Uh, so these are policy decisions and ones that have in many, in many cases been justified by Christian faith. And so because of my own sort of personal experience of seeing people whose lives are ruined by just lacking access to basic necessities and my own recognition of this sort of responsibility as a Christian and as a Christian preacher uh, for the, the stories that have been told that have justified this, um, I have increasingly been drawn uh, to learn from the uh, Christian and moral traditions that challenge poverty. And it turns out, even though I wasn't taught to read this way, uh, there's actually a lot in the Bible that challenges poverty. And there's a lot in the Christian tradition. And uh, um, my friend, uh, the uh, Reverend William Barber, who is one of the co-leaders of today's Poor People's Campaign, uh, he, he began to teach me years ago uh, that if you pay attention to the prophets uh, in, in the Bible, that what they help us to see is that actually the well-being of society depends on learning from people who are poor and marginalized how the whole society can heal. Uh, one of my favorite expressions of this is actually in the Psalms, in Psalm 118, um, which I, I grew up in churches that had these praise songs. I don't know if y'all are familiar with praise song culture, but we had one that uh, was actually based on this psalm, uh, because this is the psalm that says, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it, which sounds like a pretty happy thing. And, you know, people who are trying to rile up a crowd to get up and sing that as a chorus but that chorus is immediately preceded by this. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It's a recognition that uh, the, the best day, the bright day, the great day that we're looking forward to, you know, when all shall be well and all shall be well and all manner of things shall be well, they quote another Catholic saint. Uh, th that day is the day when the people who are rejected in society are actually lifted up to be the ones who can reconstruct society. And, and, and it was that biblical tradition, actually, that helped me to begin to see that this is actually the only thing that has ever pushed the United States toward our sort of aspirational goal of a more perfect union and, and the things that we say we're committed to, like equality and justice for everyone, right? It's, it's when the rejected people uh, who had been enslaved in the South gained for the first time the right to vote after uh, the Civil War during the Reconstruction era. When, when those formerly enslaved people began to vote alongside white populists in the South and form fusion coalitions, it's actually the first time in my, in my, in my home country, my, my, I mean, I don't mean nation, I mean the way we talk about country in the South. In my, in my home place, it's the first time that everybody was guaranteed a right, to, uh, a right to a public education. That happened because the people who had been rejected formed fusion coalitions and said, we're going to tax those plantation owners and use the resources that were built up from stolen labor to make sure everybody has access to education. That, that was a revolutionary idea made possible because the rejected stones came together to imagine a new day. Um, that's what Dr. King and others were looking back to in the 1960s when they were building a, again, a moral fusion movement, right? A fusion movement of people who were impacted by different issues, but calling them together to say, you know, we, we can not only have civil rights and voting rights for everyone, but those things make it possible for us to be a society that can 
They can guarantee fair housing and affordable housing for people. They can guarantee access to health care and to living wages. Uh, it's often forgotten that the March on Washington, you know, when Martin Luther King gave his famous I Have a Dream speech, was a march for jobs and justice. And on the agenda of the demand was a living wage, which then was $2 an hour. The $2 an hour if uh, indexed for inflation then would be close to $17 an hour today, right? People were saying, we need to earn enough uh, from our work to take care of our basic needs. That these are the kinds of movements that have been possible when people of various backgrounds have come together around a moral center and moral concern and the rejected have led that fight. And so I'm grateful today to be part of uh, a renewal of the Poor People's Campaign. The uh, Poor People's Campaign was the last initiative that Dr. King led. He was leading when he was assassinated in 1968. And it, it really grew out of this vision of, uh, of, of the folks who had uh, come together in the South to challenge Jim Crow uh, moving beyond challenging these segregation laws, which were in many ways um, a sort of uh, a sort of social arrangement to prop up an economic system, and to say that in fact the whole economic economic system needed to be changed, and that that impacts many people. And so they reached out to Chicano workers on the West Coast, to folks you know in welfare rights organizations in the cities in the in the North and in the Midwest, in the West, uh, reached out to poor folks in Appalachia, right, who uh, were not the kind of people who had been in the civil rights struggle, but who nevertheless knew, knew poverty and knew how it was impacting them and said, if we all come together, if we all come together, it is possible to challenge this country to live up to the basic guarantee of justice that would make it possible for all of us to not only survive, but to thrive. In the richest country in the history of the world in the 21st century, Poverty is the fourth leading cause of death. It doesn't have to be that way, right? These are policy choices, but it's not possible to change the policy until you change the political conversation. So how can a poor people's campaign today build the capacity to change policy? That's the question we've been pushing since 2018. And we have a plan. Uh, we tested it in 2019. Uh, there was a gubernatorial race in Kentucky, and Kentucky seemed like a great place to think about this kind of fusion coalition, because you have cities with uh, large uh, African-American and Latino populations, but also lots of poor white folks out in Appalachia, particularly in eastern Kentucky. Uh, we worked with a lot of organizations there, and they, uh, they came up with uh, what they called their hood to the holler campaign, right? Folks, folks from the hood to the holler coming together <clears throat> to build... A, a commonwealth for the common good uh, in, in their language. They they used moral language. They talked about how these were moral issues, not you know uh, issues of being liberal versus conservative, not not caught in a lot of the you know sort of cultural wedge issues that had been used to pit you know people in urban centers versus people out in the country. Um, but things like living wages and health care and access to voting rights. And uh, they had a white Christian nationalist governor at the time who um, uh, was running for re-election. Uh, the man who was challenging him uh, decided to embrace the language of this movement, and he won. He won in 2019. Um, what was interesting when we looked at the numbers afterwards is that, you know, typically a Democrat could win in Kentucky only by increasing turnout in the cities because the cities are the centers of, of um, you know, registered Democrats in Kentucky. Uh, and there was some increase in the cities, but the increase in the cities was not enough to uh, overcome the margin of, of, of victory with his opponent. Um, what he had to have was an increase out there in Eastern Kentucky. So it turns out that poor folks in Eastern Kentucky had gone and talked to their neighbors and had convinced enough people to vote, people who don't even usually vote, uh, that uh, it, it made up the difference and they were able to change the leadership of their state. Um, it, it's a model that we saw work there and were able to invest in uh, you know, organ, organizing people around in 2020. Um, there's, a, I think, a huge myth that, uh, that poor people vote against their interests. You've probably heard it. Uh, a lot of the coverage of the so-called Trump voter 
has uh, you know sent people out to these rallies and talked to people and has sort of conflated the the non-college educated white voter with poor white people. <clears throat> but if you look at the numbers uh, in 2020, uh, people who make less than fifty thousand uh, dollars voted Biden over Trump by fourteen points. I mean, there was a huge difference. Uh, uh, it, it was the actually the widest margin uh, of any uh, splice was the income difference. Um, so the the reality is that a lot of poor people know that uh, the, the the folks who are sort of selling their bill of goods to them are not uh, serving their interests. What they don't know is that there are politicians who would be willing to push for policies that could help them. And so um, when we surveyed uh, low propensity voters across the country, over and over, what we've heard people say is that they're not politicians who speak to our interests. So this year, the Poor People's Campaign, without any partisan commitment, has, has committed to go to poor communities with poor people and low wage workers leading uh, the canvassing and to reach 15 million voters in the country this year, uh, 15 million potential voters, uh, in order to uh, give them the news that they have the power to swing the election in almost any state. A third of the electorate in the United States is poor or low income, the, the technical definitions. Uh, in, in most swing states, it's uh, as much as 40%. Um, th this, this group has more power than any group to change the, 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 the margins in terms of what could, uh, could, could, could shift the election. And so the Poor People's Campaign is organizing and uh, is inviting people like you to show up at state houses on March 2nd. Uh, because when poor and low-income people are leading the way, it's also an opportunity for folks who share a moral vision, uh, from whatever their tradition, uh, to come together and to build these kinds of fusion coalitions with them. And so we want to demonstrate what that looks like at state houses uh, here in Indiana, uh, where the, the, the numbers, I looked at them before I came over here, the, the, the numbers here in the state are very reflective of the country. One third of your population. Uh, it's two and a quarter million people in Indiana are poor and low income. Um, that's a poor and low income people, according to the research that we've done, um, uh, vote at 20 to 22 percent less less frequently than their higher income neighbors. Um, so, you know, you don't have to do too much math to realize that that's a, a huge potential for people to turn out in order to shift elections. Uh, there'll be a rally at your state house here uh, in Indianapolis, uh, in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I'm from, at 30 state houses across the country, there are going to be rallies on March 2nd. It's a it's a real opportunity to see what it looks like for the stones that the builder rejected to become the chief cornerstones to 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 stand together in public. And then on June 15th, uh, we're calling people from all around the country to come to Washington D.C. and to make a mass demonstration of this effort because. It's one thing to get people to show up to vote, but what we've seen is that it is that these kinds of campaigns have a huge amplification when we can persuade people who are running for office to speak directly to this constituency. And so, you know, while we want to talk directly to a lot of voters, we also want to to demonstrate the power of this of this coalition even before the elections uh, in order to compel people who are running for office. To, to, to stand and say, you know, this is something that I am committed to. We've introduced in the U.S. House a resolution. It's called the Third Reconstruction Resolution. You can look it up on the list of bills in the U.S. House on the, on the U.S. House.gov. But it's an outline. It's, it's not a single bill. It's an outline of, of, of all of the policies that could be passed if we had political leadership who were committed to ending poverty sort of an aspirational outline. And what we're saying to candidates for any office, you know, all across the country is, is do you believe in this vision? Would, would you want to represent people in a way that could work toward this vision? We're not going to get there next year, but movements build over time in order to have power and the potential to, to first lift up the voices of the people who've been hurting and then stand together and say, we're not going to be silent anymore. 
So I'll close with one final song that I'd like to teach you. You might not know this one yet, but um, it comes out of this movement. Uh, and um, I'll bring you back to where I'm from. <laughs> so there's a song leader in our movement. Her name is Yara Allen. And when Yara came to my home county of Stokes County, North Carolina, years ago, uh, she came first to listen to people who were involved in a struggle with the local energy company because for years they had been dumping coal ash uh, in the community and it had seeped down into the groundwater. And there were all of these mysterious cancers that people had had. And, uh, you know, folks were just dealing with it, but then started telling stories in the community and realized other people had had things. And then their doctors started recognizing, oh, y'all are all from, you know, up there close to Boobies Creek, and that's where they dumped the coal ash. And so people began to get to know each other, and they were having these public meetings and telling these stories. And they were white folks, and they were black folks, um, but, you know, they drank the same water. And um, they, they were united by the pain of having lost many loved ones to, to this environmental degradation. And so as, as Yara listened in a church that evening to people telling their stories, uh, she wrote this song, and uh, it's kind of become an anthem of the Poor People's Campaign. So if you're going to go to Indianapolis on March 2nd, or if you're planning to come to D.C. on <laughs> all right, June 15th, uh, uh, this is kind of choir rehearsal. You'll know the song when you get there, all right? So <laughs> it goes like this. Somebody's been hurting my people, and it's gone on far too long. It's gone on far too long. I'll tell you, it's gone on far too long. Somebody's been hurting my people, and it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. You got it. Stand up. Somebody's been poisoned the water. And it's gone on far too long. I'll tell you it's gone on far too long. I'll tell you it's gone on far too long. But somebody's been poisoned the water. And it's gone on far too long. And we won't be silent anymore. All right. Well, thank you so much. I I uh I hope we've sung ourselves into community and uh maybe talked ourselves into a conversation. Do we have time for a few? Sure. Does anyone have a question they'd like to ask? And it ain't gotta be a question. You can weigh in. <laughs> okay. I want to thank you uh for your reflections and um, very insightful. I just finished a book called The Forgotten Girls by journalist Monica Potts uh, from Arkansas. And in the book, um, she as a journalist does a study where she looks at why she got out mm. from the rural community in which she lived and why her friend Darcy didn't get out. Mm. And one of the conclusions she comes to, and she, she does it very well, not in a judgmental way, is the church. Oh. the evangelical yeah. tradition that existed or exists in her community. And it just made me think of the poverty cycle yeah. that she looks at in this book and, and a reflection on what you're talking about. I'm just wondering, have you experienced that yourself in terms of coming from an evangelical tradition? Yeah, thank you. Um, so... I mean, I, I tried to say briefly here that uh, white Christian nationalism is an ideology that has infected churches. Um, I am a Christian, and it is not Christianity, um, but it certainly uses the language of Christianity. And um, to, to your point, it blames people for their situations in ways that I think traps a lot of people. Uh, 
And so, yes, um, there are lots of situations in which the only way people can get free from the sort of ideology that is that is uh, keeping them stuck in family systems and church systems that sort of reinforce their oppression is to get out of those communities. Um, I think that does have to happen. And I come from one of those communities and deeply love the people within them. And I believe, I know, that um, back in the late 70s, people with a lot of money made strategic decisions to come after my grannies, right? This is not the faith that had sustained them. My, I, when I was growing up, I couldn't go see my granny without her saying, we got to sing, I'll fly away. Y'all know that old Baptist hymn, I'll fly away? My, my granny was a song leader in a Baptist church. Now, faith can always be distorted. And I'm not trying to say there was anything perfect about this church. But my granny was a poor woman who worked in a mill. And the thing that kept her alive was the songs that she sang and led in that church on Sunday mornings. There's power to that faith. And the people who started the religious right recognized that power. And they decided to exploit it and to come for it and try to use it for their political agenda. That pisses me off. Let me just be honest. Because that's not why my granny believed that stuff, right? Um, so I am, I am on a bit of a crusade to challenge white Christian nationalism, which means, I, I, and I think you have to be careful, that doesn't mean that those places and those people are evil, right? The ideology is evil, but there's a lot of good people. And it also doesn't mean that good people in those places haven't done and said bad things. Because that's also true. <laughs> and uh, and so to the question, you know, or, or to the particular case that you pose of, you know, looking at someone's life, like there are situations where I have walked with people who had to get out of the family system that was keeping them trapped in a mess. But I don't give up on those communities. So what I usually say is that, you know, people who can need to stay and fight for the truth in these places. And we need to be gracious to people who've been crushed by the lies and say, you know, you, you, you need to find a better community, which means, and I think this is a key thing for anybody who has a progressive vision of a future for this country, we have to invest in building community in these places for people who don't want to be white Christian nationalists. Because I can tell you, uh, um, Actually, Ann Nelson wrote the book on this. It's called Shadow Network. She's a journalist at Columbia. She uh, looked into all of the organizations that have now invested billions of dollars in building a cultural nexus in which uh, there are echo chambers for the lies of white Christian nationalism. And, uh, you know, if you've ever seen a journalist going to one of these places and stick a microphone in people's mouths and ask them questions and, you know, you look and say, how could anybody believe that? This is sort of the story behind that. People can believe that because everybody they trust tells them it's true. The preacher at the church says it's true. They turn on the radio when they're driving the tractor and it says it's true. You know, they get these free things mailed to their house that says it's true. Um, you know, you might know from your own experience or from, you know, your own education that the trans kids aren't coming to get you. But these people are told every day that the trans kids are coming to get them. And they believe it because, you know, it's, it's being told to them. And, and, and all I'm saying is that there's a, there's a lot of organizational structure behind that. So if we, if we have any hope of a functioning democracy where we can actually, you know, work through difficult things together, because people are never going to agree on everything, you know. Democracy is supposed to be how we work it out when we can't agree. If we have any hope of that, we've got to invest in some communities and spaces 
in rural America where people who don't want to be part of that can go. Because I'll tell you, there are a lot of people who don't who don't want to, but there are precious few public institutions in my home county where you can go and and the people who are in charge are not on the payroll in some way of these organizations. Um, or at least, if they're not on the payroll, they're at least sort of uh, subject to them. If they get too far out of line, they'll be reprimanded. So it's an important question. I thank you for it. Yes. Um, how do you how do you think or speak productively about the role of personal agency without ignoring or pointing the finger at them, without ignoring policy, the role of policy decisions, environment, community, and so forth? Right. Like I, yeah. It seems like we often say it's either entirely your fault or you just throw up your hands and you bear no responsibility. There is personal agency. It's going to vary by context. So how do you speak productively about that without just you know? Yeah. No, it's a great question. Um, every one of us has to make choices every day. Those choices matter. And uh, there are better and worse choices. I mean, each of us has to sort that out. Like, I know that personal experience. I've also raised some kids. You know, you got you to walk kids through this, and figure out, like, what, what kinds of decisions are you going to make? So all that's real. I don't deny any of that. And I always tell people, if there are groups of people who as a group consistently end up with the short end of the stick, that ain't choices, right? You can't attribute that just to choices. Uh, if you do, then you have to have some sort of anthropology that says there's something about that group of people that makes them make worse choices. We usually call that, you know, racism or right. ethnocentrism, you know, those ideologies that would explain that. So if you, if, you, if you don't ascribe to those, then you have to account for the fact that, well, given that, you know, people make good and bad choices, but, you know, most people do that within a range. You know, there's, in every community, there's some outliers on both sides. There's some people that make a good choice every time, and there's some people that, you know, you know, they're pretty good at making bad choices. And, you know, there's a big group in the middle that is, uh, you know, probably closer to 50 50. Um, yeah, we're human beings. We make good and bad choices. But when we consistently see that there are people who are ending up with, worse outcomes than other people, then I think we should always ask the question, what, what are the policies that are conditioning which choices they have to make? And, um, and that's where I've come to see on the issue of poverty, that there are very real things that we can do. Uh, that, and there's, there, there's pretty good evidence-based solutions that, uh, that people don't argue a whole lot about. Uh, I'm, I'm saying people in research it don't argue all about. Um, we had this conversation with Philip Alston. Philip Alston was the special rapporteur for poverty for the UN, who was commissioned a few years ago to tour the United States and you know write a report on extreme poverty in the United States, which you know to the UN is a sort of peculiar situation because there's extreme poverty in the world, and often that makes sense in terms of world economic policy, but. The United States has a disproportionate amount of extreme poverty given our GDP. So they had this report. And uh, what Alston said to us at the Poor People's Campaign, because he visited many of the places where we've been organizing, is he said, um, he said, you know, in the United States, you don't lack the resources to address the problem. And you really don't lack the, the policies that could make a difference. <clears throat> he, he said, but, um, but what you do lack is the will to do it, like the political will. And he said, uh, I'm not a religious person, but that seems like a God-sized problem to me. <laughs> you know, he's talking to preachers. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think that sort of issue of the conscience, like uh, wherever it is that people find their moral center, we've, we've got to find a way to reach that and to compel 
a majority of people in this country to come together to build the kind of political coalition that could advance these policies. Uh, I understand that there are lots of forces against that, but if we don't do that, it seems to me uh, we cannot sustain this kind of divide. Uh, I think it is at the root of a lot of the uh, um, tensions that are often explained in other ways, right? The, the, the tensions around politics, around culture, um, a lot of it is people knowing that something is wrong and, you know, buying somebody's argument that blames it on somebody else. That's my take. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so um, you've talked a lot about pol like the political will and, and policy and all of that. And um, I actually, after the 2016 election, I actually ran for my state legislature and won mm -hmm. um, and served during the pandemic. And well, thank you, Representative Redmond. Redmond. <laughs> um, and, and, and I had to leave due to a health crisis, mm -hmm. but... I was there for four um, years at the leadership level mm -hmm. with a super majority able to put a lot of these policy things mm -hmm. in place. And we did a lot of good work in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I just have come away seeing the limitations of that system. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the system we have, yeah. but there are so many limitations and it's designed to move super slow. Yes. And so I just wonder, like, like, are there other ways that people can come together and really work? I know the political system and I, I have no less respect for it and willingness to kind of like, and I made sure that when I had to leave, um, my district re was replaced with the first woman of color ever to serve in our, so it, it's been an incredible journey. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if beyond the political, like, what can we do? Well, it's a great perspective. Thank you. I mean, you, you're absolutely right. Um, uh, politics can't fix everything. Um, and policy doesn't fix everything. But there, you know, like you're saying, there are, there are some things that are not possible without policy changes. And so it's really important to be invested on that level. Um, I come at this um, sort of recognizing that the obstacles to the political change or the policy changes that we do need are political and more than political. Uh, a lot of this has become a kind of cultural divide in this country. And so um, I really believe in movement building because I think movements can create new culture. Um, and this, uh, I, I didn't have time to go into this, but this, this notion of having sort of so moral fusion coalitions find moral traditions to root themselves in and ways to fuse people across groups that have been divided in some way or another. Um, and they have a long history in this country. Um, they're hopeful to me because I do think they can create a new political majority in the way I was talking about. But I think in the process, they also create all kinds of new bonds, right? That can that can lead to, you know, people having dinner with people they haven't had dinner with before, people's kids growing up with kids they haven't. So uh, there's a lot more to it also. Um, so I'm a big advocate of movement building. Um, but again, that also doesn't fix everything, right? So this isn't a sort of utopian vision for me. Uh, it really is about, I mean, democracy seems to me to be the best way humans have figured out how to work things out in an imperfect world with imperfect people. Um, uh, I'm also a Christian, right? And I believe in the kind of both personal and social transformation that uh, is possible on a level that's beyond what humans can come up with. So I pray and work for that all the time too. Uh, um, and ultimately, you know, as a person of faith, I believe that uh, uh, there is one fine day when you know the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God, and He shall reign forever and ever. 
quote my tradition, but uh, uh, but until then, right? How are we going to work things out? Well, we 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 we're going to have to do the personal work, right? To love imperfect people, and we're going to have to do the collective social work to uh, um, pursue as much justice as possible. Cornell West often says, you know, justice is what love looks like in public. Uh, I think that's a fairly good way of summarizing uh, what our collective efforts to build a kind of more just political system can be. It can be a way of loving as you as you try to serve uh, and you serve in that way and you realize, you know, you can't get everything you want. But ain't that true when you try to love an individual too, you know? I've been married a few decades now, you know, you, you know, you, you, that's not perfect either, right? But we, but we keep, we keep trying, keep trying. And that's, um, yeah, I guess that's how it makes sense. That. So thank you for your question and for your service. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Let's give a Notre Dame thank you.